all my goods and chattels. Okay. Just turn that down. All right, so today we are on the final Sabbath of our Happiness Habits series. Throughout the month of November, we've been doing topics for inviting happiness back into our lives. And today is the last day. So right now I'm going to focus on forgiveness. And then at Ignite, at 12 noon, Jordan will be looking at gratitude. Um, so we'll do that. Oop, just got to find my notes. That was the children's story. All right. <laughs> Okay, so forgiveness, yes. We're going to continue our story and I was talking with my son and he told me that I have to give credit for this to Pastor Ricky Schwarz, S-C-H-W-A-R-Z, for this part of the story. All right, so Chaplain John gets a call early in the morning. It's the grade four teacher. She was supposed to have organized hot lunch with the parents and she'd forgotten. And so she rang up Chaplain John and said, look, can you rescue us? Can, can you stand in and, and do something great for us? And he said, yeah, sure, I can do that. So he very quickly got dressed, jumped in the car, reversed down the driveway really fast. Thud, bump. Oh no, what did I hit? What did I run over? So he stops the car, he gets out, he has a look on the driveway. And there on the driveway is the neighbor's little doggy. It's a cute little doggy. And now it's a dead little doggy. Chaplain John picks it up and he goes next door and he's holding dead little Dougal in his arms and he knocks on the door and Bob comes and he opens the door and Chaplain John is just standing there. No words coming out of his mouth. The lips are moving, but it's like the vocal cords are frozen. He doesn't know what to do, what to say. And Bob sort of had an idea because he'd heard the thump and he heard the yelp of the little doggy. And he says to Chaplain John, look, man, you know, this, this is horrible, um, but I forgive you, you know, but I... My kids are at home, they're inside, and, and I don't want them to be distressed, so would you do me a favour? Would you just go down the back of my yard and, and bury Dougal down in the backyard? And I'll keep the kids away from the window, and, and I'll explain it all to them later on. And so Chaplain John does that. He, he says, OK. So he, he goes and, and buries Dougal, hops back in the car, and goes on his way to help with hot lunch. All day long, Chaplain John is feeling terrible. He's just remembering the events of that morning and he's mad at himself because he didn't say anything. He just stood there making lip movements with no sound and he didn't apologise, he didn't do anything and, and he's not coping really well with this. So when he gets home that day, oh, he goes over to the next door neighbour. He goes down the backyard. This gets a little gruesome. He digs up Dougal. Digs him up, takes him. Knocks on the front door. Bob answers the door. And uh, Bob sees Chaplain John standing there holding Dougal, who's now covered with dirt. And he's going, what? And Chaplain John says, man, I'm so sorry. I said nothing this morning. I didn't apologise. I wanted to apologise. In my head, I was apologising, but it wasn't happening. And I just stood there and I didn't say a word. And Bob's going, uh, this, this is a little weird, man. Uh, go and put Dougal back. I forgave you this morning. It's over. Go, go and bury Dougal again, please. Oh, okay, so Chaplain John goes and buries him. <sighs> the next day, Chaplain John is still really, really remorseful. Like, he feels so bad. Dougal was such a loving, wonderful, just cute little doggy. And how could he do such a thing? And, and how could Bob forgive him so quickly? And, and you know, oh, I have to make it right. I, I have to do something to... Just apologising isn't enough. I have to make it up to them somehow. And I definitely need to apologise for killing Dougal. All I did was apologise that I hadn't spoken in the morning. Uh, I just need to make this right with the kids somehow. And so Chaplain John goes next door to the backyard and digs up Dougal 
and carries him to the front again and knocks on the door. <sighs> Bob answers the door. And John launches into his speech about how sorry he is that he killed the little doggy. Bob says, I have forgiven you. I am not holding anything against you. Man, you got to let this go. Bury Dougal again and do not dig him up again. It's over. You are forgiven. <sighs> What's happening here? Chaplain John had been forgiven, freely forgiven, but he couldn't accept it. He felt that he had to do something to earn or to deserve forgiveness. He felt that he had to prove somehow that he deserved forgiveness and he couldn't experience the forgiveness that had been freely given to him until he'd earned or deserved something according to his own ideas. I know the story was a little bizarre and gruesome. I apologise for that. But symbolically, this is how we are. We think that we earn or deserve God's forgiveness because we've acknowledged what we've done that was wrong. We've confessed it. We've been intensely repentant. We've worked at making amends and we've done all that. And so now God can forgive us. And because that's the way we think about God, that's how we are with each other. We demand that the one who has hurt us acknowledge it and show remorse and repentance and start making amends before we can forgive them. And oftentimes, even if they do all that, we still don't forgive them. We hold on to the judgment rather than extending grace and forgiveness. And this is because we have a wrong picture of God. God forgave us 2,000 years ago, before we were born, before we had sinned. He has already covered the debt for every sin we have ever done or ever will do. There was no demand for repentance and confession and proof of change and making amends and all the rest of it. God freely forgave us 2,000 years ago. All that other stuff, the acknowledging, the confession, the repentance, the everything else, that's for our benefit, to help us be better. Because when we do that, we take the power out of the guilt and the shame and, and we're able to be set free from it. And we can experience and receive God's cleansing as he washes us clean from that guilt and shame, setting us free to live more happy. So in our relationships, it's vital that we get into a headspace of grace rather than judgment. And that's a lot harder to do than to say. Dr. Les Parrott, who's a psychologist, tells us that by nature, we want people to earn our respect, to win our acceptance. We're quick to dismiss people when they miss the mark or make a mistake or mess up. We need people to pay for their mistakes and their wrongdoings to prove that they've changed before we extend forgiveness. Our nature seeks fairness and justice, not mercy and grace. We hold on to bitterness and anger and rage, and so we see God as being the same. Do you ever find yourself repeatedly going to God and asking forgiveness for the same event over and over and ago? You realize that you did wrong, you realize that you've hurt others and you've hurt God, and you feel bad about it, and so you ask forgiveness. But something stops you from believing that you've been forgiven from experiencing that amazing cleansing that God wants to give us. Guilt remains. And so we go back again and again, asking again and again for forgiveness, digging up the same event over and over. Some will tell me that they believe God has forgiven them, but they can't forgive themselves. What that says to me is that person has never actually really experienced the enormity of God's grace. If you have experienced the free gift of God's forgiveness, there is nothing left to forgive yourself for because he has forgiven us. We need to let go and accept that God has fully forgiven us and that he sees us as if we had not hurt him or others. Forgiveness, giving it and receiving it is vital for happiness. So, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is my choice to let go of my right to hurt you for hurting me. Forgiveness stops and looks carefully at the wrong done. It allows the emotions that 
are dredged up from that wrong, tears, anger, whatever it is, to be expressed, and then it seeks restitution through some process of justice. Forgiveness does not give tacit approval to the wrong that has been done. It does not mean a denial of the right to legal justice. However, what you need to know is that legal justice does not balance the scale. Because when a great injustice has been done, it is not just a legal matter, it is an emotional experience as well. And forgiveness is needed to set you free from the pain and the resentment and the bitterness and the anger and everything that comes with a great injustice. And when you've been set free from that, you are free to be happy again. I forgive, hang on, to let go of the hurt, to let go of being eaten alive by resentment or anger, to let go of the responsibility of being judge, jury and executioner. I forgive because I realise that but for the grace of God, there go I. Forgiveness enables me to stop being consumed by the wrong that was done to me and to live again fully, joyfully and free. We all have and we all will hurt others. We are all in need of forgiveness. We need to recognise that given the right circumstances, all of us are capable of horrendous things. I think one of the clearest pictures of that is from World War II. When Nazi Germany rounded up people and put them in concentration camps, they were being treated worse than they would treat an animal. They were being exterminated, humiliated, just treated dreadfully. And the people in the nearby towns largely did nothing, which is equally horrendous. We are sin-filled beings who are capable of horrendous things. And the only antidote is holding on tight to Jesus accepting his forgiveness offered freely to us. When we receive grace rather than guilt, it opens space for transformation. So forgiveness brings healing to the recipient as well as the giver. So how do we get to this place of forgiveness, this place of healing? First, we must want to forgive. We need to pray for a heart that is open to forgiveness. And, you know, some of you are sitting there, the automatic thoughts in your head could sound something like this, but I'm not ready to forgive yet. I can't forget what they did. They'll get away with it. They'll hurt me again. They don't deserve it. It's not fair. What if they do it again? I'll look like a fool. We have a lot of stuff happening in our head that tries to hold us back from forgiveness. So let's go to the ultimate example of grace, of forgiveness. Jesus on the cross. He's been beaten, he's been spat on, fistfuls of his beard pulled out, he's been flogged, he's been stripped, humiliated, mocked, and nailed to a cross. In the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke focuses on the humanity of Jesus. So this is Jesus in his humanity. And this is the only place where these well-known words are recorded. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. So in his humanity, Jesus offers grace, forgiveness, and empathy. And how do the people respond? They sneered, mocked, and gambled for his clothes. Hard-hearted. Jesus is graceful, and it seems to have absolutely no impact on those who are being showered with grace. Now, this is really important for you to catch, people. We extend grace not because we expect the other to respond well and to change. We can hope that happens, but we cannot expect it or demand it. We extend grace, forgiveness, because it is a gift that God has given to us to set us free to live happy, abundant lives and to open space for reconciliation. He is the God of reconciliation. Empathy is the secret to loving well. Empathy and criticism or judgment cannot coexist. 
and we get to choose which path we are on. Do we walk the path of the world where we focus on how we've been victimised and hurt and wronged and we see the other one as bad and mean and demand retribution? Or do we walk the path of the kingdom of God, where we put ourselves in the other person's skin, where we try and see the incident through their eyes and think about it with their thoughts and feel it with their feelings and then have empathy for the person who hurt us? That's what Jesus did for us. It tells us in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Jesus is in us and all the bad things that happen to us, he feels the hurt and the pain. He feels it. So he, Jesus, he's the ultimate example of empathy. Empathy, where we get inside the skin of another. Jesus did that literally. He gave up heaven, he came down to earth and got inside the skin of a human being. That's what he did. He experienced life the way we do. And we need to let go of judgment. We need to let go of criticism and hold on tight to empathy and forgiveness. So on the road from grumbling to happiness, we need, number one, to pray for the willingness and desire to forgive. And number two, we need to focus on growing empathy and letting go of judgmentalism. There's a, a therapist, Brent Atkinson, who's done a lot of research in, in couples therapy, and he's created um, a list of 10 habits of successful relationships. The number one habit, the thing that is most important, the point where we have to start, do you know what it is? Avoid a judgmental attitude. Let go of that criticism stuff. Give the benefit of the doubt. Assume that the other person, from their perspective, has valid reason for behaving the way that they are. And then try and understand what that is. Try and get to know them. It's really, really hard to do that because we are by nature really judgmental people. Why can't that mother control her unruly kids? Oh, look, that guy is constantly smiling. It's really obnoxious and so phony. What a bunch of angry losers out there protesting. They really need to get a job and do something more constructive with their time. And what's with all this depression and anxiety? They just need to snap out of it and pray, and then they'll be good. Look at all the happy things that are happening. Generally, we are oblivious to the fact that we are being critical and judgmental. We just see it as accurate and right. He said something that offended me. He was wrong. He shouldn't have done that. Whoa, she's really showing insensitivity in that comment. Whoa, that's not good. This is a judgmental, critical mindset. We feel compelled to point out to others the ways in which they don't measure up. If somebody points out to us the ways in which we don't measure up, we and others play the find the bad guy game. We point the finger and we say, you're just as bad as me, if not worse. And we up the ante and then they play find the bad guy game. And it just goes from bad to worse. We do not think of ourselves as judgmental. We think of others as judgmental, but not ourselves. We are addicted to our delusion, our self-righteousness. Judgmentalism keeps us from becoming better grace givers. We can't give grace while we are feeling self-righteous. And so number three, grace comes only from a humble heart. The Bible talks about being meek and humble, and we fight against it. Well, we don't let anyone know we fight against it. We give lip service to it, and we say, yes, we should be meek and humble. But in our heart of hearts, we don't want to be that person. We don't want to be the meek and humble person who gets walked all over and ground into the ground. You know, that, that's what we see meek and humble as. And, yeah, well, that's not who I want to be. I don't want to be trodden on. And if that's what God meant when he told us to be meek and humble, I wouldn't want it either. But that's not what God means. The humble person, the meek person, is the one who's gotten over themselves. They've recognised that it's not all about them, it's all about God. And their whole focus is on sharing God and his love. And it's not about me, it's not about being self-centred. I have 
a favourite book. It's called Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's just a little book. Hear what it says about what it means to get over ourselves. It is the love of self that destroys our peace. While self is all alive, we stand ready continually to guard it from mortification and insult. But when we are dead and our life is hid with Christ in God, we shall not take neglects or slights to heart. We shall be deaf to reproach and blind to scorn and insult. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? For how many of you is self alive and well? I know it is for me. God and I are working on that. This picture fits perfectly with the Greek concept of the words meek and humble. Um, William Barclay is a world-renowned New Testament scholar and he tells us that meekness or the humble person is the perfect balance between always angry and never angry. Yeah, I can hear that. That's a surprise, isn't it? All right. The person who is humble is able to use the energy of anger at the right time and never use it at the wrong time. So that begs the question, what is the right time and what is the wrong time? William Barclay tells us in his commentary on Matthew, a general rule for life is that it is never right to be angry for any insult or injury done to ourselves. That is something that no Christian must ever resent, but that it is often right to be angry at injuries done to other people. Selfish anger is always a sin. Selfless anger can be one of the great moral dynamics of the world. Is that a new paradigm for you? To be humble means we recognize it is not all about me. It is all about God. In every situation, if I call myself a follower of Christ, then my actions will tell people who God is, who Christ is. Am I showing the world a God who does not forgive? <laughs> miserable bad things are happening all the time am i showing the world a god whose forgiveness has no impact on me oh bob yes Dougal's really stiff now and he's covered in dirt but i still have to ask forgive when i see someone acting in a way that i don't like am i inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt to try better to understand their situation, to have empathy for them? Do I humble myself and acknowledge that I am a sinner just as they are and both of us are in need of God's grace, equally in need of God's grace? People, grace is unfair. It is irrational. The way of Christ is not the way of the world. But one thing that I really love is that psychological research keeps revealing that the way of Christ is the way to have happy, healthy relationships and lives. When we live the Sermon on the Mount life, Matthew 5, 6 and 7, and there's a lot of stuff in there that's really radical about forgiveness, I would encourage you to read it. When we live that life, research tells us we have stronger immune systems. We produce more serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin, which are all neurotransmitters and hormones that make us feel really good and woo, upbeat and happy. We have lower cortisol, which is a stress hormone. We have better blood pressure. And so when we are living God's way, the kingdom of heaven lifestyle, physically, emotionally, psychologically, we are way better off. We feel good. So... How do we get to be better grace givers? How do we get to be more graceful? How do we avoid a judgmental attitude? How can we be free to forgive? One thing. We experience God's grace toward us. Like the woman caught in adultery, we know that no matter how bad we've been, how trodden on, beaten up, used up, how stupid, how selfish, all the rest of it, and other people, how self-righteous and mean-spirited, doesn't matter. God loves us with an unstoppable, radical, extravagant, indestructible love. 
There is nothing we can do that will make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do that will make God love us less. God's love for us is absolutely complete all the time, regardless of what we are thinking, feeling, and doing. We need to love like that toward others. Many pay lip service to grace, but they don't live it. Grace doesn't seem to make a difference in their life. We hear people preaching about it, and we agree with it, and that's it. That's as far as it goes. Instead of being unswervingly confident of our unconditional acceptance in Christ and feeling it resonate deep within our bones every day, we just keep falling back into the habit of trying to earn God's grace and God's love. We tend to feel better about ourselves when we're winning the approval of others and, and so we think we have to win the approval of God as well. When we're measuring up to the standard that we have set for our lives, we, we feel pretty good and, and we get a little self-righteous. When we're not measuring up to the standard we have set for our lives, we, we don't feel so good and we get a little self-condemning and, and hopeless. So whether we're in the group of self-righteousness or self-condemnation, either way, it leads to being judgmental and grace-less. We need to realise this truth. Grace is is received, not achieved. To be able to forgive, we have to continually go to God and receive his grace. Whoever has been forgiven only a little, loves only a little, according to Jesus. And it's the same. If we don't have an awareness of the enormity of God's grace for me personally, I won't be loving much. The more I can receive God's grace, the more I wallow in his unconditional love and acceptance and the forgiveness that he gives, then the more I am able to give that to others. Without God, our human nature will stop us because by nature we are judgmental. God's forgiveness does not depend on what we have done for God. It depends on what God has done for us. When he died on the cross, God's grace deep within our bones is the only true and lasting antidote to judgmentalism. And it's the only prescription for healing relationship wounds, allowing happiness to return. As I focus on God's unconditional love and forgiveness of me, his unstoppable, indestructible love for me. And I know I say that all the time, but it's true. And, and it's good to remind ourselves I no longer need to puff myself up at the expense of anyone else because I am loved. I am safe and secure in my relationship with God. So God's grace sets me free to love others. It sets me free to be full of grace rather than judgment. I am set free from being easily offended. I am set free from insecurity. I am set free from measuring myself and others against my imaginary standards. I am set free from criticism and judgment. And I am free to love and be loved. Isn't that a much better way? Fear restrains us and it hardens our hearts. So fix your eyes on Jesus and allow his perfect love to drive out fear. God's forgiveness opens space for empathy. At a physiological level, we are designed to connect with others in loving relationship. On your handout, have a look at it. It talks about mirror neurons. Okay, so on the road from... Grumbling to happiness, we need to, one, pray for the willingness and the desire to forgive. Two, focus on growing empathy and letting go of judgmentalism. Three, yes, seek God's transformation to have a humble heart. And four, know beyond a shadow of a doubt that grace is received, not achieved. I would encourage you to look at your handout in your bulletin on the back of it. There are some actual practical things that you can do to help you forgive, to let go of the hurt and the pain um, just generally. And the third one is about specifically within really close intimate relationships, steps that you can take for forgiveness. Um, it's in the bulletin, but it's also on the website in the blog section. Experience God's amazing grace. His forgiveness, his acceptance, and his love. Be overwhelmed. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were at our worst, while we're kicking him in the teeth, while we're treating God horribly, 
He died for us. His love was radical. Open your hearts to be more graceful and less judgmental. When we receive forgiveness freely and freely give forgiveness, we will be happier and everyone around us will be happier too. So we need to humble ourselves. We need to recognize the enormity of God's grace towards us. Freely you have received. Freely give. I would encourage each one of us to go and grace others. What we're going to do now is spend a little bit of time in response. We've had the word of the Lord and we're going to have some songs. The first one is a special music about surrendering to God. So while it is being sung, I would encourage you, please, to be praying and, and maybe read the words on the screen and make this your prayer and just surrender any hurt and anger and bitterness and resentment and all the rest of it. Give it to God and then join in with the team as they sing. <laughs> 